Hi, so I am Shannon. I'm one of the grade six girls leaders and I'm going to share about one of the main things that God has been showing me and speaking to me over this past year. And there's two kind of main points to that and that is to trust God with my plans and that in doing so God's plans are way better than my plans could ever be. So I'm just going to start off with a couple of verses that have really like showed that and amplified that to me. So I'll pull those up. It's Isaiah 55, eight to nine. And that says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So that's just been very impactful to understanding the benefits the joys and just the peace that surrendering my plans to God offers. Um, and yeah, so with that, I have been a planner throughout my entire life. Um, when I was younger than basically any of you guys here, I had my entire life planned out well into my 20s. Um, and those plans sort of got jumbled around my last year of high school. But for the most part, I still had set plans that I was sticking to and nothing was really going to move me away from those plans. And that included doing a Bible school in Australia at the beginning of 2020. And when I was there, uh, one of my mentors told me that she doesn't make five-year plans anymore. She doesn't make one-year plans even. She just wakes up every day, asks God his plans for that day, for that week, for that month, for that year. And that may seem super inspiring, but that terrified me knowing that I didn't really have control in that, um, but that I would, yeah, just have to surrender that to God. Um, and a couple months after that um, is when COVID's starting to get pretty serious. And just all of the plans that I made up for that entire year were gone. Um, I was sent home at the end of March so that I didn't get stuck in Australia when I was supposed to have four more months planned, knowing what I was going to be doing. Um, and there was just so much uncertainty in that time that the only way that I could make plans was by trusting God, because he knew what was gonna happen when literally nobody else knew what was going on. Um, and so through that and having to trust God and um, like almost being forced into that, I've had so many experiences and like opportunities that I never would have had if I did what I wanted to. And so even though it wasn't initially what I chose to follow God's plans and fully rely on Him, that's the only option that I had. Um, and so just along with um, being able to give up the stress and the pressure from making my own plans, there's so much peace in knowing that God's plans are the best plans for you specifically, not only because God just has the best plans in general, but because he knows my strengths and my weaknesses, um, like my personality and my desires, just everything that makes me me. He knows all of those things and he has the best plans for me based on that. Um, so yeah, I've just seen so much um, from what God has shown me in those areas that he has the best plans in general and the best plans for me um, specifically and surrendering what I think is best will ultimately lead me to what is best. Hello Foothills youth, welcome back. It's so good to have you here this week. Hey, thank you for just tuning in uh, and being willing to see what God might do even on Zoom or in person or wherever we are by the time this is played. Hey, tonight we're talking about hypocrisy. And what comes to your mind when you think about the word hypocrite? Maybe it's someone like a famous celebrity who is advocating climate change and then they jump on their private jet and they shoot down to the Bahamas for their vacation. Or maybe it's your mom or dad. I know my parents when I was learning how to drive, they said, don't speed, use your signal light at all times. Then the next morning we hop in the car and they're speeding and they're changing lanes without a signal light. Uh, but for Christians, we can define hypocrisy like this. We're hypocrites. When we say we are Christians, that we identify with Jesus, who he is and how he wants us to live our lives, but then we don't actually live our lives in accordance with that. Hypocrisy is when we say that we are a part of the kingdom of God. That is the things in heaven, things like perfect peace, 
righteousness, justice, and love, when we want to see those things in the world around us, but we don't actually act in a way that shows those things. Now, I bet that most of you can think of a time in your life when you were hurt by someone who said they were a Christian, but then acted against that. Now, I did a bit of research on what Gen Z, that is, people your age, people born between 1999 and 2015, what they thought about hypocrisy in the church. Now, for those that did not attend church at all, those who would say that they're not Christians, 23% of them said that people at church are hypocrites. Now, what's even more shocking is that people who are Christians, that is, people like probably most of you who attend church, who are here at youth, 36% of them say that people at church are hypocrites. That's one in three of you guys who are within the church think that people are hypocrites. Now, I don't know about you, but if the people inside the church can see it better than the people outside, we might have a problem. Now, I want to clear up what I mean by hypocrisy in the church, because there's different extremes. Uh, the one extreme, for example, there's a church in the States, uh, and their number one mission is to let gay people know that they're going to hell. They have a very hateful anti-gay message. Now, I don't know about you, but this doesn't reveal who Jesus is to those people. And you know what? I bet that there's been a lot of people hurt and actually have a bad perception of who Jesus is because of what this church has done. Now, I don't think that's going to be uh, seen a lot in our youth group. I think that what we might have to face is this idea of a gap in our lives. Um, that's when we say that we believe in Jesus, that we come to youth, we profess who he is, we love his lifestyle and what he does in us. But yet when we go to our schools, when we go to the grocery store, our life doesn't actually, doesn't actually reflect that. So my question for you to think about now is this, is there a divide in your life? Is there this gap between what you say Jesus is, what you believe in your heart and in your mind versus what your actions actually communicate to those around you. So why does this matter? Who cares if we're not living a life that represents Jesus at school? Being a Christian is actually pretty difficult. I was in junior high school once, I was in high school, and I know that the times where I tried to uh, communicate Jesus to my friends often isolated me. Uh, it put me at odds with what they thought was cool. But the truth is, we're representing Jesus in the places that we are that you and I as believers of Christ actually get to demonstrate his love and his compassion in our actions, in how we present ourselves to those around us. So I asked my friend Sam, uh, who used to attend church but no longer does, what he thought about hypocrisy in the church. And this is what he said. I do believe there is a lot of hypocrisy in the church, especially with the younger crowd that will go to church on Sundays, then go to the club on Fridays. And I feel like they're really friendly and judgment-free to outsiders. But once you're a part of the community and you deviate from the church social norms, there's a lot of judgment that follows. Like I said, Sam no longer attends church. Uh, and I wonder if the catalyst to that or the biggest factor of why he doesn't go to church is because in a time in his life where he was just looking for love, he was looking to fit in with a group. The group that he went to first exiled him. They said, we don't identify with your lifestyle and you can't be a part of our group. Is that what we want our youth group to be known for? Do we want it to be a place where we can invite those who might be different from us to come in, uh, even if their lifestyles are far from what we say we might want them to be? Do we want to be pointing our finger at others, or do we want to be inviting them in and showing them the love that Jesus brings? Carrie Newhoff, a thought-leading pastor in Canada, says that non-Christians think that Christians are the worst friends for three reasons. They're judgmental. They're hypocritical, <laughs> and he just said they're bad friends. They're bad at doing the things that friends are supposed to be doing. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. It's identifying that divide that is in a lot of our lives. When we listen to the words of Jesus, we read our Bible, but when we go out into the world, we're not actually doing those things. It, we're not letting it transform us from the inside out and presenting that to the world around us. I've been there, I've seen that defied. And so has Peter, one of Jesus' disciples. He knew what it was like to live with this gap in his life, to not want to be associated with Jesus when it became difficult to do so. We read in Matthew 26, 
Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it before all of them, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And when he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied it with an oath, and he said, I don't know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you also are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And then he began to curse, and Peter swore an oath, saying, I do not know the man. And at that moment, the rooster crowed, and then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out, and he wept bitterly. Have you denied Jesus at some point in your life because you didn't want to be associated with him? I have. I know what that gap looks like. Let me tell you a story. When I was in junior high and high school, I actually fell into a pornography addiction. Now, praise God, this is not something that is a part of me anymore. Uh, the love and work of Jesus has rid this of my life. But at one point, it was one of the biggest factors, one of the hardest things I had to go through. I remember one day in grade 10 during gym, uh, I was hanging out with my best friend Khalid. Uh, at one point, he just asked me, he said, Jason, do you watch porn? Viewing this as an opportunity to look cool, to fit in with the world around me, I said, of course I do. Now to this day, his response rocks me to my core. Khalid replied, but aren't you a Christian? Aren't you supposed to avoid these things? I can't think of another time in my life where I misrepresented Jesus as much as in that moment. I communicated to Khalid as much as Peter did to the bystanders that the power and love of Jesus was not enough to transform my life. That this Jesus I like talking about or I like going and hanging out with at youth wasn't enough to make a difference in my life. Now by the grace of God, Khalid and I have actually remained great friends and he's seen me overcome pornography and I now get to share that with him and how Jesus has transformed my life. Now I'm sure there's some of you here tonight who have been hurt badly by people like me, who have misrepresented Jesus to you uh, and who he is. Maybe you can relate to my first friend Sam, feeling so much judgment from youth or from church that you want to leave the church. Or maybe you're like Khalid, uh, who left that conversation in grade 10 even more confused about who Jesus was than he was before I started talking with him. If you've been hurt by church or by a Christian, I just want to apologize on behalf of the church for you. I'm so sorry for however that may have damaged your walk with Jesus or how it may be putting you in a position right now um, where you feel like you need to leave. My prayer for you is that you just seek the love of Jesus. You seek Christ's followers who are authentically living for him. Ask Jesus to reveal who he is to you. And there's going to be others of you who can relate more to me. Uh, you at one point in your life have experienced that divide and you've misrepresented Jesus to your friends. You may need to apologize to Jesus like I did and even send a text to some of your friends that you may have hurt, just letting them know that you're sorry and that you want them to experience Jesus in his fullness. Remember to pray for humility because often our pride or our sense of not wanting to let others know that we've messed up comes before us and gets in the way of us actually apologizing for those things. Now that question again, why? Why does this all matter? By this point, I hope you've caught my explanation, but if not, here it is. Authentically, living a life for Jesus matters. It matters because you and I are representing Jesus to friends like Sam and Khalid. Teresa of Avila says that Christ has no body on earth now but yours. That means that you and I, Christ followers, are actually doing the work of Christ when we represent him in our lives, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. That we get to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven, that is that righteousness, perfect peace, uh, justice, compassion to those around us. That we get to show that there's something different about Jesus and what he wants to do in this world than what we're currently experiencing. And I have a vision for our youth group. What if we were known as the people who authentically lived for Jesus? What if in our neighborhoods, people looked at us and thought something was different? They thought something was different because we're actually showing that love to those around us. 
Now, in a minute, we're going to throw some personal reflection questions up on the screen. And there'll be different types of questions. Some will be for those of you, like my friends Sam and Khalid, who have been hurt by people like me. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to forgive those that have hurt you. Ask Jesus if you need to forgive them and for his love to pour out on you. Ask that Jesus would heal you of that experience. Now, for those of you who relate more to me and Peter, um, being a hypocrite, misrepresenting Jesus to others. You may need to send a text to someone apologizing for the way that you may have hurt their perception of Jesus in the church. Then ask that the restoring power and love of Christ would come and transform your life. Ask Jesus if there are any areas that he wants to work on right now. Then finally, I invite you all to ask God for a vision of your life and for this youth group, uh, for him to just pour that out on you. What does he have to say about perfect peace? righteousness, compassion, mercy, justice, and love in your life. Maybe that could look like you reaching out to an old folks home and seeing how you could actually be a blessing to them during this time. Maybe you need to go out and start sharing Jesus more uh, in your school and with those around you. Be open. Trust that Jesus will speak to you when you ask him to. Lord Jesus, come speak to us now. Uh, fill us with your perfect peace. Uh, transform our lives, then we may go out and represent you authentically. Silence all distractions around us, including the voice of others and ourselves. And Lord Jesus, speak to us afresh now. Thank you.